since the CI has not been formally laid before Parliament, we take this opportunity to call upon the EC to abandon the idea altogether. We wish to serve notice that we will use every lawful means to resist this latest effort to undermine the right of Ghanaians to vote and in the process skew the electoral system in favor of the MPP. We will mobilize the broad masses of Ghanaians to wage a sustained and unrelented campaign to prevent any attempt by the EC to strip large sections of the population of their right to vote. Right, so uh, Sam Nete George, Member of Parliament, Ningo Pram Pram, uh, is here with us. Kojo Pumpunia Sante is on the Zoom, and Dr. Srebo Kweku, as well as uh, Bryce Simmons. Why this suspicion and this particular position on what the EC is seeking to do, which it does before every election? Well, something, uh, good morning to your viewers and to yourself. It's not suspicion, it's literally fact, because a draft CI has been put before the subsidiary uh, legislation committee of parliament. So there is a document before parliament that we're addressing. When you read Regulation 1-3 of that, that, that draft that's before parliament, it says a person who applies for registration as a voter shall provide as evidence of identification the national identity card issued by the National Identification Authority. Specific. I mean, so these are no suspicions. These are real statements of the fact. The suspicion is about that it will be skewed, the, the elect electoral system will be skewed in favor of the MPP. Well, certainly, because when you look at the issue of the Ghana card, a, a national identity card issued by the NIA, you're referring to the Ghana card. Right. This is seeking to replace the provisions in CI 126, where it says that the person who seeks to register should provide a valid Ghanaian passport, a national identity card. It leaves it open as a national identity card and also goes ahead to include a guarantee system. There's a reason why you include the guarantee system, because of Article 42 of the Constitution, which says that which basically sets the framework for voting rights, gives you that right. It says you must be a Ghanaian, you must be of sound mind, and you must be 18 years. Those are the only qualifications. A CI, which is subsidiary to the constitution, is now introducing a limit to your ability to exercise that franchise by saying you must have a Ghana card. The NIA on its own will admit that close to 3.5 million Ghanaians of voting age do not have the Ghana card. Mm -hmm. Two million have not been able to register. Another 1.5 million have registered and either have not been able to receive their cards or their cards have been blocked due to administrative issues. Elections in Ghana have been decided by 40,000 people. Hmm. So 3.5 million people being disenfranchised. Again, when, the CI, when, when you look at the CI that has come and you read provisions of the CI, it talks about the, the fact that you, 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 can no long, you would have continuous registration. Now... What the EC is suggesting is that you're going to have a register that is going to be the function of multiple laws or multiple CIs. Yeah, because continuous registration is already captured by the, the existing CI. Yeah, CI. You understand me? So why do you want to do a special CI now for just continuous registration if that's really what you claim you're talking about? If what you're looking at is not to do gerrymandering. Again, something. Where you come from and where and a constituency, my constituency, for example, my EC district office. And the continuous registration is going to happen at district offices. At first, we used to have continuous registration in polling stations. Then we agreed that it was too much of work. And so we brought it to electoral areas. And we do them in one location. And these electoral areas are a cluster of polling stations in the same locality. Now, what the EC is suggesting is to move it to the district office. Now, if you use Ningo Pram Pram, for example, the Electoral Commission's district office is in Pram Pram. Now, you have someone in Pantrendor who wants to register. How does that person register? That person has to pick a vehicle and transport themselves all the way to Pram Pram. He has to pick a motorbike and two taxis. In Ningo Pram Pram, if the person was coming to. If the person was coming from Uchebliku, he'll have to pick a motorbike or a taxi from Uchebliku all the way to Mangochunya or Mobole, from there to Afienya, from Afienya to Dowenya, from Dowenya to Pram Pram. I mean, to get registered. And this is in the heart of Accra. I'm not going up north, where some of the distances will be 80 miles to make it to the district office. So you disenfranchise Ghanaians by, pep, by, by, by particularly taking this step. Again, the challenge there is, P 
people must be able to identify their polling stations for purposes of voting on election day. Now, a person coming from Ojebleku who doesn't even know what the name of his polling station is and shows up in the Pram Pram office after bearing that cost is asked to register. You now leave that person at the mercy of, an, of a district officer, election, electoral commission office, officer, to determine where to place that person. You could place him in a polling station that is not closest to his home. You have disenfranchised that person because that person will not be able to. Now, we hold a suspicion. Now, here we come with a suspicion that this is to aid the NPP in gerrymandering. Because then what you will do is, you, you pick Ningo Pram Pram's register and realize that, okay, in a particular polling station, Sam George did this well in 2020. You want to drop his votes in 2024. And so when individuals from this particular polling station, which should be a stronghold of Sam George, come to register, instead of registering them in their particular polling station, you put them in another polling station, or you even punish them. Take, for example, I'll give you a community called Agoto in Ningo Pram Pram, which is under the Ningo traditional area, but politically falls under Shai Sudoku. But most of the people there register and vote in Ngo Pram Pram. So to punish that person, instead of putting him in a polling station at the Panchen or DA school, you put him in a polling station in, in, in Chai or Sudoku, or you put him, or if it's the person is somewhere around New Jerusalem, you put him in Punkatamanto. Now that person on election day believes he's registered in Ngo Pram Pram. But because you've gerrymandered and used politically minded persons to put him in a different polling station, you've disenfranchised this person. These are real things that we know and see happening. And we're saying if the system is not broken, you don't fix it. We have a system that works for us. Why is the Electoral Commission seeking to change it? The last issue I'll raise because of time has to do with the, 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 the conduct of the current Electoral Commission. I try to stay away from personalizing issues, but you can't do that in this matter because we sit today where we are based on a lot of electoral reforms that were suggested by the IEA, which was, which was a CSO that contributed immensely. And you cannot take that away That's from right. them. That's okay, right. Where we sit today as a, as a democracy is thanks to the input of CSOs like the IEA, which at the time was led by the current chair, chairperson of the Electoral Commission, Jean, uh, uh, Jean Mensah. Yes, today, she tells us that IPAC, which was the vehicle through which IEA was able to push a lot of his suggestions and, and get reforms done, is no longer a constitutional body. Yes, we know it's not a constitutional body, but a convention that allowed us to bring our democracy to the place where today there's an electoral commission she can chair. She's seeking to bastardize it. Mm. The actions of the IA and the fact that, look, you, you used to have an electoral commission that had consultative processes. Now you have an electoral commission that is dictatorial. An electoral commission that puts together the modalities and the guidelines and calls the NDC that come and let us tell you the guidelines. Who sat down to do those guidelines? You want to put together a committee to work on this. Previously, you would have the NDC would have two reps on that committee, the NPP will have two reps, and then other political parties will have one rep. Thanks to Jean Manson's ingenuity <laughs> and, and Stella abilities. Today, the NDC is asked to bring only one rep. The MPP is asked to bring one rep. And then the rest of the mushroom parties that she's accredited, who don't even meet the, 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 the legal requirement for being regarded as, as, as political parties because they don't have offices in all 275 constituencies and are not functional. She's giving them three reps. So the NDC has one. The MPP has one. And parties that don't even have offices have three. I mean, where okay. is Jim Mensah let's, let's get to interrogate these um, thankfully, Dr. Strubo Koko joins us, but I would like for him to listen to um, my other two guests, and then <clears throat> he will begin to uh, share with us. And this is not the first time, you know, we have uh, dealt with this matter here on this platform, but it is being accentuated because the NDC uh, held a press conference and has stated very clearly that if this is not removed from Parliament, um, they will take certain steps and people are a bit uncomfortable with the, with the posturing because you need a peaceful process. Um, Bright, you have had issues um, to do with the technical matters and procurement issues with these uh, processes. Um, but what do you say about the arguments made by the NDC? Thank you, Samson. I have not, um, unfortunately, I've not been able to get a copy of 
you know, the address that you showed us at the beginning um, by the chairperson of the NDC, even though I've, I've tried. So I don't have the full range of issues they've raised before me. So what I will do is I'll just focus on our ongoing concern with two terms. One, the way the identification system is being implemented nationwide, which is leading to serious infraction of rights and rather than encouraging the uh, exercise of rights, this ID card is actually now becoming something that suppresses rights. All of us supported national ID. I remember that Imani was part of the World Bank group that was put together to think through these matters as far back as 2012. We wrote detailed reports about it and we've always been very supportive because a lot of people cannot afford passports and some of the other ID cards that prove that they are Ghanaian. So a free nationwide multifunctional car is a great thing, but it should come to enhance people's lives, come and enrich people's lives, not become another instrument with which the elite beats poor people, marginalized people, uh, underprivileged people. The second ongoing concern we've had is with DC and the way it does a stance. I mean, I have, we've had, you know, electoral commissions come and go. This is the first time we're having an EC that fundamentally, fundamentally refuses to engage with stakeholders to come to consensus on any matter of national interest. I don't know why. Every time they come up with an idea and people raise legitimate concerns, they brush it aside and they try and use power to bulldoze through. Let's take this EC uh, decision to use only the Ghana card as an example. It does not make rational sense. Very simple. When you go for the Ghana card, there is a set of requirements that you must meet to prove citizenship and link to that identity. Because citizens and identity are interlinked. Knowing who you are establishes whether or not you are Ghanaian. Those are primarily the things that the, the Ghana card can achieve at this stage of implementation. They've said so many things about it's used in other areas, but at this stage of implementation, it's primarily to prove citizenship or if you're a legal resident in this country, to prove you're a legal resident and to prove identity. And the Ghana card accepts, as we well know, a number of different types of identity proofing measures. They accept a birth certificate, yeah. they accept a valid passport, right. and they accept an oath of identity. In fact, a relative, one relative, just one relative, can come in and say, I am the relative of this person, and I say he's Ghanaian, and they have to give you a Ghana card. We cannot understand how, if that is possible, if that is possible, then when it comes to the case of the voter, you were saying that the same things that I used to establish my citizenship and identity, in the case of the Ghana card, is not acceptable when it comes to the citizen. Hello. Yes, you are on right. So first point is that we are only looking at two terms, proof of identity and proof of citizenship, and they are interlinked. If one government institution that is established to decide if somebody is a citizen or who they say they are can accept a passport, a birth certificate, and witness testimony, I can understand why another state institution whose job is to let allow someone to do something based on whether or not that person is a certain that regard. And then they say, well, if you go to the uh, uh, Ghana card registration point and you manage to use a relative to prove that you're, you, you, you are Ghanaian and then you are issued with a Ghanaian or a citizen uh, ID card, we will accept that. But we will not allow you to use the same mechanism that you used to establish your identity and your citizenship mm. at the first stage. Right. In our case, makes no sense. Absolutely makes no sense. Okay. The second point is that the challenge proceedings, the Ghana card, where when you are trying to get the Ghana card, mm. there is room that is made for people to be challenged. That's right. Similar ones exist at the EC as well. Now, the argument is that if the EC claims their goal is to prevent people from uh, being challenged and et cetera, and creating chaos on the grounds, then they cannot use the Ghana card because within the Ghana card system, it's itself a basis for challenging people who may have unscrupulously acquired the Ghana card. And people come to the, police, uh, the registration center to register. Secondly, the points that have been made that the Ghana card have additional credentials like the digital address 
etc., etc., are irrelevant. One, because primarily we are focused on citizens about identity, not where people live, mm. not whether people sell uh, rice, not whether people have diabetes, not any of the mm. other ancillary benefits that people have said the Ghana card will give to us. In fact, some of those I, I requirements for the Ghana card nowadays are perhaps unconstitutional. The requirement, for instance, to have a digital address. We have 5.4 million people in Ghana who live in slums, many of whom are actually homeless or have no fix, place mm. of fixed abode. Mm. To require that they have a digital address is more or less to exclude them. And if that is the requirement to get the Ghana card, which means that it's higher a requirement, mm. we cannot require that if people that are coming to vote where the requirements are simply citizens with identity, go for a card where there are higher requirements. It doesn't okay. make sense. All right. Lastly, mm. we have problems with chaotic management, things which are not planned through. We saw this th the same thing with the same registration, where we didn't recognize that diplomats are exempt from having the Ghana card. And then we proceeded to try and create a situation where we will have registration based on Ghana card, whether or not you are a foreigner or a citizen, and then realize later that diplomats have to be exempted. And we're trying to force the telcos to make adjustments to these things while the blocking process was underway. It's like this creates fundamental concerns, as well as the fact that the government itself is in breach of its own regulations. The right. regulations that they are using to require tells us that you must give me my Ghana card in 30 days. Mm. The way the, the, the express uh, 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 claim there is that the, 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 the card must be given to you in 30 days. It's not happening. If that is not happening, on what basis, if the government itself is in breach of the law, can you force someone to have the Ghana card mm. as a mechanism of okay. exercising a very important uh, right? All right. Many people, well, they don't even have biometric registration. Mm. The majority, we have biometric registration. When I come to the EC, now this is to show you the Ghana card, they will register me biometrically. That makes Ghana one of the few countries, that one third or so of countries around the world, okay. where you have such strong security mm. measures. Yeah. And it's enough. Okay, Brian, because of, because of our time limitations, let me go to uh, Dr. Kojo Pumpunia Asante. Um, let's see if we can have you, uh, your rendition or view of this situation in the next uh, five minutes so that we can have a bit of some time for the Electoral Commission to respond to them. Yes, Dr. Kojo Pumpunia Asante. Thank you. I hope you can see me. Yes, please. Go ahead. Um, yes. All right. Good. Okay. Um, well, thank you, and uh, uh, good afternoon uh, to every, uh, good morning to everybody. Um, I think, I, for me, really, we have to be really careful not to throw the baby with the bathwater on this matter. And I'm really hoping that, you know, the NDC, the EC uh, stakeholders can move forward on, the, on this issue because, for me, it's not a complicated matter uh, that we should be splitting hairs on. Uh, first of all, I I, I attended two. Um, um, uh, IPAC meetings when uh, these matters were being discussed. And subsequently, uh, I also received reports when I didn't attend, I received reports of deliberations on these matters. Um, this is the, the issue of, about this is not uh, just happened today. Uh, you have to go back to 2016 uh, when uh, I think CI-91, it was very clear that we had decided as a country that we need to move from this Sort of periodic voter registration you know process that you know brings all kinds of violence and manipulation and so on to a continuous registration system and the the, the law even in ci 91 was very clear that the electoral commission had to develop modalities in consultation with the political parties the registered political parties to set out how this was going to be done and the ec uh, after 2020 i think even before 2020, there was a, there were, had been attempts to discuss these modalities, but it didn't, you know, go anywhere. After 2020 started these processes through IPAC to discuss it. And if you read the IPAC reports, it was very clear that even at that time, uh, political parties raised questions about using the uh, ID as the sole evidence of, you know, identity as a citizen. And the, in the back and forth and the negotiations or discussions then, the suggestion was that, okay, the EC will seek advice from the Attorney General uh, and, and even do some pre-legislative engagement with the Subsidiary Legislation Committee on these matters before uh, the process will be laid. So I think it's wrong for anybody to suggest that there's not been uh, a stakeholder engagement on this 
on yeah, this but, matter. Uh, Dr. Asante, I know the NDC. Dr. Asante, the, the NDC is raising practical challenges about no, I'm coming. the I'm, implementation I'm, 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 if the CI is passed in the form that it is. You are saying this is if, not if something that... Me, this is not something that there should be here No, if you allow about. me... What's the way forward on it? I'm building a... I'm building a... Pre, a pre, I had to state that premise because it's important, you know, that we state what is factual. So what I was saying is that the NDC has not been on, on IPAC for a long time, and I know that they have stated their reasons why. But I know also that, yes, they send them copies of what the deliberations are and all of those things. Now, the assumptions that were made at that time was that the, electro, uh, the NIA had begun this process of, uh, uh, using the, uh, of registering people, and there was a certain expectation that they could reach certain numbers. Now, this was almost, this is going back 2021, you know, matters. Certainly, the, the environment has changed. The NIA has clearly told us that uh, what they have registered, the challenges they are having, and given our economic challenges, are unlikely to reach those numbers. So for me, it's a very simple matter. Certain assumptions were made that, oh, if people are turning 80, and remember, this is about continuous registration. Mm. It's about those who are turning 80. And yes, from 2021 to now, if you look at the numbers from Tasca service and so on, you could have over you know, 2 million or so people who will fall under that category. And therefore, it means that if you insist on using NIA, you are going to have a definitely disenfranchised people. So based on the assumptions that were made, that now, given the realities on the ground, that's not. I don't see why we should be quibbling about whether or not we should restore things like guarantees and so on in the text to deal with the current, current matter. I think one of the other things is uh, passports. Actually, the guarantee system for passport is actually even more robust than for the NIA. So I don't, for me, I don't see any, I think the assumptions that were made at the time, which for me, I support, that we have to eventually bring everybody, you know, in, under the NIA system. But you have to be practical. If it was uh, feasible then, it's not feasible now. It's not likely to be feasible by 2024. Mm. And therefore, we have to address those things. Okay. So I think we should just come to that reality and accept that what assumptions we made mm. uh, do not pan out now. In that regard, that. They, in, that, in that regard, should it be a withdrawal of the CI put in parliament now because the, 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 the current, the status quo takes care of continuous registration, takes care of your Ghana card and the guarantor system? Yeah, so, so I'm actually surprised that it was late because as I said, in even the deliberations, the, the condition was that there will be a discussion with the Attorney General on even the constitutionality of limiting, you know, the identity, uh, the, the production of evidence uh, for identity, and then also a pre-legislative process with subsidiary legislation. So I thought those things would be complete. That, that would have brought the NDC in mm. and other stakeholders in to agree that, yes, we can go forward with this or not go forward with this. If that deliberation had been held, and the EC is still insisting, then I think the EC then will be, will be incorrect because they, the, the reality on the ground does not that support the assumption that was made previously last year. So for me, I think that if that's the case, then you have to withdraw because, of course, the time starts to run when you're late. Okay. The, the related mm. issue is mm. of the registration center, mm. which uh, 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 Mr. Sam George has raised uh, issues about. And it's all, so this is all to do with the continuous registration. If, for example, we start continuous registration now and somebody is to walk in in that place, how do we ensure, you know, that, you know, that everything is above board and so on and so forth? We haven't talked about, you know, maybe monthly, monthly publications of people who have registered. We haven't talked about how you tie the challenge system to that process after the registration has been done in a continuous system so I think there are ways to address this with all the knowledge. There's a lot of experienced people who have been doing this. I know that all around the world, everybody is trying to deal with attestation as a, as a way because it's been abused okay. in the past. All right. But there are ways that to, to, to solve this. Mm -hmm. And I really think that we shouldn't you know, kind of kill ourselves around it. Let's just be realistic 
and factual and move forward. All right. Uh, Dr. Kojo Pumpune Asante is Director Advocacy and Policy Engagement at the CDD. And as far as he's concerned, the ball is in the court of the EC. Uh, so it does appear that at least listening around this table, the EC is alone. Dr. Sri Borkweku, Director of Electoral Services, uh, Electoral Commission, how do you respond? This will be the second time you are trying to explain this to us through this platform. Uh, sounds and good. Uh, good morning and my regards to your listeners. Good morning. Uh, I would have wished that you give me the question for me to answer. But first, uh, let me address uh, the issue. Uh, I think Dr. Fubunas Ante made a very uh, important statement that this, as, um, when anybody says that you are not being dialoguing, then the person may be far from the truth. Because uh, immediately after the 2020 elections, uh, as part of the reforms, we decided to reactivate the continuous registration. So we had a lot of dialogue with stakeholders, including our normal APAC people. And you know, APAC is for political parties, but we allow uh, CSOs and our development partners to be part. So it is something that we have deliberated on it not less than five times. So that is it. And with respect to the NDC, when we were doing the review of the 2020 elections, it was at that part room that they said that any meeting that we will call that has the 2020 election as part of the agenda, they will not be part. So initially, our understanding was that they don't want to discuss the APAC the 2020 election because they were in court. But later, all these developers that are coming in, but, uh, I think they are new development because they were not part of the reason why they worked out of the IPA. The main issue was that they were not ready to discuss the 2020 election. So that is the better ask Dr. Pumpin said. All our meetings, we invite them. And when we finish, we send them uh, copies of the minutes. Again, the details that people are maybe losing sight of is that it is part of the CI that after the CI has been passed, the committee will sit and discuss the detailed modalities of the implementation. So it is within the implementation that some of the issues that they are raising could be addressed. Now, those two are saying that registering people at the district, which my brother Sam George raised, is that people will not know their, their politicians, which is not true. Because if you look at the 2020 registration, we reserved the district offices for the vulnerable. So those people who, people with disability, like taking mothers, advanced pregnant people, people uh, a lot of people, the people who are 65 years and above, they all registered in the district. But they were assigned to the police station. So this is how it works. You, you, agree, that, you, you agree that it's on a minor scale and this is going to be on a rather mass scale. But beyond that issue, he also raises the question of you know, cost to the I, voter. I, if you allow me to, to land on that. Please go on. This is not the first time we are doing registration in the district office. So what happens is that, Thompson, you know where you are coming from. So we are expecting that when coming from the house, you know where the people within your locality vote. So you will come and tell us that we vote at this place. So from what we want, by your description, we have the table that will tell you, oh, this is the place that we put you there. If you have, and I'll be surprised that somebody who is 18 years and of sound mind will come to our district office and he doesn't know his locality. In that case, you don't even qualify to register. So the person who is coming should be able to describe his or her locality to us. And based on the description, if you know the police station where your parents or your relatives are voting, you tell us we'll put you there. But if you know, don't know by your description, we will put you at where you are, you are coming from. Again, I don't, I, I'm not expecting somebody will come and the person doesn't know the district where he or she stays. I was surprised. So all these things will help us to narrow down to where you should be put at the police station. And this is not a first time I said. Mm. We have done registration where at district offices before and we don't have any challenge. Mm. Again, assuming we put you at the one center, what do we do with that during exhibition? You go to the center, you indicate that I should be put at the police station A. But I was I was only put at B, it will be rectified. So all these things will be identified. Then 
with respect to the issue of disenfranchisement, I, 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 I get a bit worried because we are not speaking to the facts. The issue is that this is continuous registration. So it is not the issue that maybe we are doing registration at the end of this year and we are done. So any day, any time you get your ID card, you can go to our office to be uh, given the ID card. Again, by the figures that we know, the statistics that we know, it is 450,000 per year. So we are looking at around 1.8 people from 2020 to 2024 to be added to the register. It's not the whole new register, but just about 1.8. 1, 1. So we believe that... Dr. Kojasante, Dr. Kojasante, Dr. Kojasante, Dr. Kojasante was saying, Dr. Kojasante was saying that all of what is being rolled out was based on some assumptions, and that clearly those assumptions are not working anymore. So, is it more prudent or not to pause and re re keep on with the status quo, and then perhaps? look to do this after the next election? Is that, is that something the EC uh, wants to think about? Our decision is based on the assumption that by the time we close registration on the 7th of October 2024, any eligible voter would have registered. So that one is still valid because we can fathom that for two years, the one for people cannot be registered. And then he has given us all the assurance that now that they have rolled out 291 decision centers, and we have go to roll out 267 decision centers, the people will have their uh, names on the candidate card. All that challenges will be rectified. Mm -hmm. And from them, they are saying by the end of 2022, all the challenges that we are talking of will have been addressed. So they will get the card, they will come to our offices, and they will, uh, they will raise us. Now, mm -hmm. something, let's throw this challenge. We have more than two years. So let's give, let's roll out the control as they say. Let's give ourselves up to the end of 2023. If genuinely there are people who are not getting the card, then we can now be arguing the argument we are putting across. What happens if by the end of 2023, everybody who wanted to raise out the card, then all the arguments become moot. So I'm thinking that I'm believing that in this world, if you don't plan, you plan to fail. So it is part of our planning that we want to eliminate non guineas helping us to choose our leaders, which it ca cannot be done in any way in this country. If you go to other countries, recently I was in, uh, in, in, in uh, Kenya, I've been to uh, Mali, other countries for elections. They all use their citizens' cards. So I don't, I don't, I, personally, it is not the responsibility of the Electoral Commission to identify who a Kenyan is. That work has been given to National Education Authority. So we shall allow them to do their work and mm. who will benefit from the fruit of their work. So in, this is my problematic comment that I can make. You don't have time to... Mm. Yes, yes, we, we have just about some two minutes to go. But my, my question to you, really, I don't think you've answered that. Uh, my question to you is that you listen to such an important stakeholder like the NDC. Of course, he, when you are running elections in Ghana, general elections, you are running for NDC MPP. I mean, we can't run away from that. And then you hear them. We have independent candidates. Yes, we know. Um, we hear them consistently complain about this. And you have CSOs, you know, very credible and important CSOs, like the CDD, like Imani. And right here on this table, I said, you are alone as an EC. Is, are you giving yourself an opportunity to rethink okay. this? Something. That must be what about the. Uh, about 13 political parties that who were part of the decision making. Sure. If we are alone, it was a decision of the upper. What about the upper? I will, I will get to the the upper minute yourself for you to read. These and are the read, these are the parties. That, no, these are the parties you are you are seeking to throw out because they don't qualify to be I, parties. I've not, not given any party we are throwing out for now. <laughs> they are part, political parties who are who are in our books. So we take a decision to expand. Any of them, they are political parties, okay. and they were part of it, and including the CSOs. Okay. So some of the CSOs were part mm. of the upper right. so It's not the issue of I, I, I electoral commission alone. Okay, uh, Sub George, you, you you are in parliament. Um, you have a delicate parliament, you know, divided right there in the middle. So, 
Others will say, use your numbers. Well, well, we don't, when we say down the middle, yes, they still have a slim majority. And so when it comes to taking the they numbers, one person one majority, person majority mm -hmm. and you just need one, one, one person. But you see, Dr. Sri Bokwako is talking theory. I'm speaking practicality. When he talks about the district level registration that was done, where vulnerable people were sent there, does he know the expense to the political parties to ensure that we had people escorting the people there? Does he know the challenges that really happened? They may sit in the comfort of their offices in the Electoral Commission and assume what goes on on the ground. We are on the ground. We are the implementers of their decisions. Again, how do you suggest that we should sit back and allow you pass a CI that is injurious to our democracy and then we should come back and discuss the modalities? If you were minded to engage us in discussing the modalities, you will present a CI that will be reflective of everybody's wishes. Is there not going some forward? time that you can concentrate on saying, look, we want to make it work rather than throw it away? In all fairness and honesty, when he makes references to the likes of Kenya and Mali, they don't have a constitution in, like the 1992 constitution that sets out the criteria for what is okay. gives you the franchise. And let me just land Sorry, here. We have, we have in, in, in wrapping up, I just want to call on the EC to realize that today, they constitute the biggest threat to our democracy with their recalcitrant position. All right, we'll uh, urge them. We'll urge them to go back to the table and consult. This has with been the political news parties. Files. And uh, my guests have been Dr. Sri Bork, uh, Director Electoral Services of the Electoral Commission, Dr. Kojo Pumpuni Asante, Director Advocacy and Policy Engagement, CDD. Sam Naite George is Member of Parliament, Ningo Pram Pram. Bright Simmons, Vice President, Imani Africa. Earlier on the economic matters, we engaged Dr. Theo Champong, Economist and Political Risk Analyst, Professor Godfrey Bokwing, Economist, uh, UGBS. And we also had uh, Samson Akligo of the Finance Ministry, as well as Kweku Enchi Bwesiakon. Um, Samson Ladia Nyanini, my outfit as always is.